All right, so you're here, which means I'm guessing you're the kind of person who wants to dig a little deeper, you know, get past the headlines and really grapple with the science and tech that might just rewrite the rules of the game. Absolutely, and that's exactly what we're going to try to do today. Yeah, we're diving headfirst into a pool of ideas that have been making waves, well, more like tsunamis, really. Right, and our goal is to navigate those waves, try to make some sense of it all for you, see if we can connect the dots. Exactly, and the epicenter of this earthquake of ideas, well, it all seems to trace back to Dr. Salvatore's and his 2019 AIAA presentation, Room Temperature Superconductivity for a Hybrid Aerospace Undersea Craft, catchily titled, right. Definitely a mouthful. Yeah. But what's important here is that this presentation, along with a series of related patents from Dr. Pace while he was working with the U.S. Navy, has sparked a whole whirlwind of discussion and analysis. Yeah, and we're going to be wading into that discussion. Specifically, we're going to focus on Ashton Forbes's really detailed breakdown of Pace work, which he shared through several live streams. Those are the files labeled 1.txt through 4.txt. Right, and along with the AIAA paper itself, that's the AIAA 2019 SE Tech Forum, Salvatore Cesar Pace.pdf, those transcripts from Ashton's live streams are going to be our compass for navigating this very complex landscape. So mission objective, yeah. we're going to try to unpack some of the most mind-bending concepts out there. We're talking about theoretical physics that pushes right up against the boundaries of what we think we know about the universe, the potential for plasma, not just as a hot ionized gas, but as a tool to actually manipulate reality, the holy grail of room temperature superconductivity, and the potential for all of these things to converge into technology so radical that, frankly, they sound straight out of science fiction. And as we mentioned, to help us weave through all of this, we'll be leaning heavily on Ashton Forbes' perspective as he navigates those AIAA slides. He offers some pretty unique insights. Yeah, he does. So let's start with how Forbes frames the core of Pace's work, what's often been called the Pace Effect. All right, so Forbes really synthesizes Pace's ideas in a way that makes it a bit more digestible. He sees the Pace Effect as a way of achieving controlled motion. How? By taking electrically charged matter and subjecting it to very rapid vibration or spin. And Forbes actually draws a parallel here to some earlier experiments by Eugene Podkletnov. You might recall Podklinov claimed to observe anti-gravity effects using spinning superconductors back in the 90s. Yeah, those are some pretty controversial claims. Definitely sparked a lot of debate. But what's really fascinating is how Forbes sees Pace taking those ideas and amplifying them. Yeah, it's not just about the spin itself. It's the introduction of electrical charge into the equation. It seems like, according to Forbes, Pius is suggesting that by charging an object and then rapidly spinning or vibrating it, you might be able to tap into the zero-point energy field. Right, that's that quantum vacuum. You know, often people call it empty space, but according to quantum field theory, it's anything but empty. It's teeming with virtual particles, constantly popping in and out of existence. A bubbling cauldron of quantum activity, essentially. And that's where Pace's AIAA presentation really comes into play. It's in those slides that he starts laying out his more foundational ideas, and Forbes really zeroes in on that. Yeah, Pace introduces this idea of the vacuum energy state, or VES, which Forbes highlights as a really fundamental concept. Pace describes it as this underlying layer, a superposition of all these quantum field fluctuations that permeate all of space-time. It's like this buzzing, vibrating quantum sea. So if I'm understanding this correctly, Pace is saying that the VES is the primary reality, and everything else, matter, energy, even space-time itself, are all emergent constructs that arise from this more fundamental VES. That's how Forbes interprets it, yeah. It's a pretty radical way of looking at things. It really is. And then, of course, the big question becomes, how do we interact with this VES, this fundamental layer of reality? Well, that's where the really exciting stuff comes in. Forbes points to how Pies proposes that high-energy electromagnetic fields, the kind we might be able to generate technologically, could be the key. He emphasizes Pies' idea that these intense EM fields can create significant disturbances in the VES, leading to localized fluctuations in the other quantum fields that make up the fabric of space-time. So the EM fields are almost like a tool, a way to poke and prod this underlying reality. Exactly. But it's important to remember here that Forbes highlights Pi's suggestion that the VES fields themselves might not be electromagnetic in nature. We're talking about using EM fields to interact with something deeper, something more fundamental. Right, and this is where Forbes starts digging into Pi's concept of vacuum energy polarization. He brings attention to the research that Pi cites, which suggests that inertia, our resistance to changes in motion, might actually arise from a system's interaction with the electromagnetic activity of the quantum vacuum. 
Yeah, the implication there is that if inertia is rooted in this interaction with the vacuum, then by manipulating the vacuum's electromagnetic properties, by polarizing it in the vicinity of an object, you might be able to influence that object's inertial mass. Essentially make it more or less resistant to changes in motion, which would obviously have huge implications for, well, everything from transportation to energy production. Forbes points out that Peyus attempts to provide a theoretical framework for this. Mm -hmm. He suggests that manipulating the local space-time energy density is akin to polarizing the vacuum, which could then directly influence the resistance an object experiences as it moves. So instead of needing massive amounts of thrust to overcome inertia, you're basically making the object more amenable to movement by altering its fundamental relationship with the vacuum. It sounds almost too good to be true, but it's what Forbes finds Pei is proposing in those AIA slides. And that's where Forbes highlights some of the more, shall we say, ambitious aspects of Pei's paper, specifically the equations he presents. Yeah, Forbes really emphasizes Pais' discussion of the maximum electromagnetic energy flux that could theoretically be achieved through this accelerated spin or vibration of charged matter. And these are not just hypothetical numbers. Forbes points out how Pays calculates some incredibly high potential energy flux values on the order of 10 to the power of 33 watts per square meter. That's a staggering amount of energy. Hard to even wrap your head around. And what Forbes finds particularly noteworthy is the connection that Payas makes between this extreme energy flux and the possibility of QED vacuum breakdown. QED being, of course, quantum electrodynamics, which describes the interaction of light and matter. Right. So Payas is essentially saying that at these extreme energy densities, the vacuum itself, the very fabric of reality, might not be able to maintain its ground state, and it could start spontaneously generating particle-antiparticle pairs. Forbes sees Pei suggesting that by achieving these conditions, we could fundamentally alter the local vacuum energy density, and that's what could lead to control over inertia. Exactly. And then Pies takes it a step further. He introduces the concept of cosmic space as a superfluid medium. Yeah, and that's not a totally new idea in theoretical physics, but what's interesting is how Forbes interprets Pies using this concept in relation to his other theories. He sees Pi's inertial mass reduction device, that IMRD he keeps mentioning, as a technology that could induce a local phase transition within this superfluid vacuum. Like shifting from turbulent flow to smooth laminar flow. And this specially conditioned vacuum, exhibiting macroscopic quantum coherence, would then allow for what Post describes as smooth sailing. He even mentions a kind of suction effect into this engineered region of space-time. That's what really stands out to Forbes, this idea of suction. Yeah, it's moving away from the conventional idea of propulsion, where you're pushing against something. Instead, you're creating a gradient in space-time itself that the craft naturally moves along. Really a mind-bending concept. Absolutely. And Forbes is also very clear about another crucial element that he sees in Pace's AIA presentation and related patents, plasma. Yeah, Forbes really emphasizes that plasma is central to Pais' theories. He doesn't just see it as an ionized gas, but as this essential intermediary for interacting with space-time. He points out that Pais' vision of a transmedium craft, something capable of operating in air, water, and space, is fundamentally based on enclosing the vehicle in a generated plasma bubble. So that plasma bubble would act as a shield, right? Protecting um, the craft as it transitions between those very different environments. But more importantly, as Forbes points out, it could also be the mechanism through which you could achieve this space-time manipulation that Pais is talking about. Exactly. And Forbes even draws attention to how plasma sheets are already being used in some hypersonic aircraft to reduce drag and potentially inertia. So plasma is already playing a role in advanced aerospace tech, even if not yet on the scale that Pies envisions. Right. Now, Forbes is also careful to distinguish between different types of plasma. He talks about the difference between a neutral equilibrium plasma, which is what we usually think of, and a non-equilibrium plasma, one with a net electrical charge. Yeah. He argues that this non-equilibrium state, where you have a net charge, is crucial for achieving those strong interactions with the zero-point energy field that Paz's theories seem to rely on. Because both the zero-point field and the non-equilibrium plasma are inherently electromagnetic in nature. Exactly. And Forbes also brings up these double layers that can form within plasmas where charge neutrality breaks down. He explains that these double layers are basically thin regions with a strong electric field caused by the separation of positive and negative charges. 
And he suggests that these structures, these little pockets of concentrated electrical potential within the plasma, could be key to achieving those extreme energy densities that past postulates are needed for manipulating the vacuum energy state. Like little engines driving the Pez effect. Really fascinating stuff. And then there's another big piece of the puzzle that Forbes explores in Pass's AIAA presentation. Room temperature superconductivity, or RTSC. Yeah, that's the holy grail for a lot of technologies, energy production, transportation, you name it. And Forbes highlights how Pass links the achievement of RTSC to the concept of achieving local macroscopic quantum coherence within a material. So basically, getting a material to exhibit quantum properties, like a zero electrical resistance, not just at ultra-low temperatures, but at room temperature. And what's really interesting is the method Pays proposes for doing this. Yeah, it's quite unconventional. He talks about using a specific type of composite metallic wire. It's got an insulating core and then a thin metallic coating. And the idea is to subject this wire to abrupt vibrations while simultaneously running a pulsed electrical current through it at the wire's resonant frequency. It's almost like using mechanical energy to induce a superconducting state. And Forbes explains Pei's thinking behind this. The idea is that the vibrational energy you're imparting to the wire would essentially overwhelm the thermal energy of the electrons within the metal, allowing them to move through the material's lattice with basically no resistance. Pais also observes that the critical temperature for superconductivity could be proportional to the square of the vibrational frequency. So higher vibration frequencies could lead to superconductivity at higher temperatures. And now the question becomes, what does all this mean? What are the potential real-world applications of these theories if they turn out to be true? What does Forbes see as the potential end game here? Well, one of the most direct applications, and this is even reflected in the title of Pai's AIA presentation, is the development of these hybrid aerospace underwater crafts, HAUCs. Forbes points out that the inertial mass reduction capabilities that Pius describes could allow vehicles to seamlessly transition between air, water, and space. Imagine the implications for transportation and exploration. Yeah, it'd be absolutely revolutionary. And Forbes also goes into the more speculative but incredibly exciting possibility of manipulating gravitational fields for propulsion. He connects Pei's concepts of controlled charged matter under accelerated spin or vibration, the creation of nested electromagnetic fields, and something called the Gerzenstein effect, which proposes an interaction between electromagnetic and gravitational fields as potential ways to achieve this. And beyond just propulsion systems, Forbes highlights how Pace also mentions potential advancements in plasma confinement and compression that could have major implications for fusion energy research may be leading to more efficient and stable fusion reactors. He also mentions Pace's U.S. patent for an electromagnetic field generator and method to generate an electromagnetic field. It's patent number 101-35366, and that patent likely provides some of the foundational technology for the concepts discussed in the AIA presentation. And it's interesting that Forbes makes a point of clarifying that what Pace seems to be describing isn't strictly anti-gravity, at least not in the way we usually think about it. Right, it's not about negating gravity locally, but rather about changing the properties of space-time itself. Forbes interprets Pace as suggesting that by manipulating the energy density of the vacuum, you could create this kind of conveyor belt effect in space-time, where the craft is essentially moved along by those altered properties. Hmm. He also connects this to the concept of endothermic propulsion, where energy is absorbed from the environment, potentially from the zero-point field, to create these pressure differentials in space-time that drive motion. So we've covered a lot of ground here, but let's try to bring it all together. We've explored Pace's theories on interacting with the vacuum energy state through these incredibly powerful EM fields, the role of plasma as this intermediary for manipulating space-time, and a truly unique approach to achieving room temperature superconductivity through those precisely controlled mechanical vibrations. And as Forbes really drives home, these concepts are not just fascinating from a theoretical standpoint. They have the potential to be truly game-changing technologies. If even a fraction of these ideas turn out to be viable, the ramifications are huge. It really makes you wonder about some of the unexplained things we see happening in the world and the possibility that there are technological advancements going on that are far beyond what we currently understand. Maybe the concepts we've been discussing offer a peek behind that curtain. And for those of you who want to delve deeper, we definitely recommend checking out Salvatore Pease's published work and his patents. They're all publicly available. And as Ashton Forbes' analysis shows, there's a lot of vibrant discussion happening around these ideas, both in the scientific community and among those who are looking at things from a more unconventional perspective. So here's a final thought to leave you with. Building on what we've explored today, 
Could these radical concepts, these ideas that seem to be pushing the very boundaries of physics, actually represent not just a path to incredible technological advancements, but also a deeper understanding of the very nature of reality itself? It's certainly a question worth pondering. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll see you next time.